Okay, good morning, welcome, and thank you for joining us. My name is John Copps, I'm from Mutual Ventures, and I'll be part of today's conversation alongside my colleagues, Ben, Kathy, and Scott, who will say hello in a moment. So this webinar aims to look at the place for storytelling as an approach in public services, its role, how it's used and how it's not used, and what it can add. And you could argue that starting from our childhood, stories are the way we understand and make sense of the world. And as human beings, we are emotional creatures and we need something that we can connect with. In the various public services that we are all part of or work with, how can stories help you convince people to use your services, convince leaders to back your services, secure the support of your teams or help you adopt and embed, and embed new approaches? So it, today is part of National Storytelling Week. And we want to help you as public service professionals think about ways to communicate what you do and the value of that work by sharing the thoughts and experiences of our panel. I can speak for the panel to say that we all approach this with a sense of humility. Our purpose here is to have a discussion and share some ideas, and we'd really like to hear from you at the same time. So a note to you to use the on-screen Q&A facility at the bottom to ask any questions you have. Leave your name if you want to, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. We'll also be sending out a link to a copy of this recording afterwards. So let me turn to our panellists who will introduce themselves. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Dickinson. I'm a senior officer in the Children, Education and Skills Strategy and Commissioning Unit at Newcastle City Council, which is one of the longest job titles I have. And uh, I only have it, I feel slightly fraudulent in the public sector, I only have it until the 10th of March, and then I have a different title, which is all about stories. I'll be Chief Executive at Theatre Hullabaloo, which is a children and families theatre company. So maybe we'll talk about uh, stories in other forms at some point as well today. Thanks, Ben. I'm, I'm Cathy, I'm Cathy Evans, Chief, Chief Executive of Children England. Um, and uh, we're the membership body for children's charities, large and small. Um, we, I've been doing a lot of storytelling all through my life, um, and we are doing all sorts of work with young people at the moment about how to tell a different story about our welfare state. But I, I've got lots of ideas to share when we get around to it. Look forward to it, Cathy. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Darrow. I'm the chief exec at an organisation called Social Adventures. We're uh, an NHS spin out based in Greater Manchester and we deliver a whole host of uh, services for the local authority in the NHS uh, alongside a, a chain of children's day nurseries. We've got a garden centre uh, and we also uh, more recently are moving into residential children's services. Uh, and uh, my colleagues will always tell you that I like to tell a good tale. So hopefully I can share some some of that experience today with you all. Right, I'm, I look forward to this discussion and I'm sure we'll go in all sorts of places. So um, yeah, strap in everybody. So I'd like to start with everybody just to ask a, a, a sort of start off question for your reaction to. So let's start basic and what is the role of storytelling in public services? Perhaps Ben, you want to go first. I, I was trying to think about yeah, I was trying to find a really clever mnemonic or, or catch word to do it. I'm sure somebody's got one somewhere in a, a theory thing, but uh, some theory somewhere. But for me, three words, illustrate, illuminate and persuade. Um, and illustrate and illuminate sound like they're the same thing, possibly, but I don't think they are. I think we do a lot that's about statistics in public services and everything has to be evidence based. That's our culture and outcome driven. Uh, and that's absolutely got its place. But people can get lost in that. And the other thing is that statistics don't always tell the story of people's experience in the way they feel it or in its true reality. So as an example from from here in Newcastle, we have very little reporting of antisocial behaviour from young people as victims. But when we consult young people about how they feel about their communities and their areas, they talk in volume about themselves as, as victims of antisocial behaviour and they tell stories. So giving them a platform to tell those stories might turn around the reporting issue, but more importantly, it, it uh, illustrates what's really going on and it throws a spotlight on those issues we might otherwise leave, lose or leave. I think for political decision makers particularly, to hear a story turns their eyes towards where the light should be and illuminates a particular corner of an issue. And that's how we're able to to persuade, and I'm always minded, I'll finish it here this, this little bit, but I'm always minded of, in a previous job, Minister for Housing visiting a homeless provision, 
We threw loads of statistics at the minister to try and persuade him to spend more money on the type of provision that they was visiting. It's absolutely tons. And then he met Jimmy in the workshop downstairs. And Jimmy told him how at 18 years old he was learning to make chairs. And that's how he was going to find his way off the streets. And that's the story he told in Parliament and ended up in every report after. None of the statistics made it through. So persuading him of what we needed. And it did release a programme to invest in hostels and improve those programmes. It came off the back of that, that visit. Um, I think the stories illustrate, illuminate and persuade in that way. And you use the word connection, John. The human history is about oral retelling of our experience from society to society and community to community. Um, without our stories, arguably, we're not humans. And if we're in public service, we're presumably in it because we want humans to have better quality existence and experience as humans. Stories yeah. make that happen. Illustrate, illuminate and persuade. Kathy, what do you think the role for storytelling? So um, uh, when I uh, when I was back at university, um, I, I spent a lot of time having my entire confidence of language and numbers deconstructed <laughs> to the point where I, I was effectively swimming around just going, nothing means anything. Um, because you can, because the words, the words that I'm saying now may have different resonance for you from what they have for me. I can't be sure that you get the same meaning from the words that I say. I definitely can't be sure that you get the same meaning from numbers that I show you. <laughs> um, but uh, many of you may be familiar with the author Umberto Eco. He is also a great semiotician, um, a, a study, the study of meaning and symbols. Um, and his assertion is that stories are the only way in which human beings can share meaning. So, and, and, and that always resonated for me. You can use whatever form to tell a story, but if you think back to Aesop's fables, <laughs> they were telling us truths, not just tales. And, uh, and so I always think, you know, we, are, we should acknowledge that we're telling a lot of stories at the moment already. This isn't about doing something new. So we tell the story nationally that the NHS saves lives. And we tell the story nationally that social care unblocks beds. You know, we tell the story that we can't afford to pay the nurses who saved our lives in, uh, in coronavirus because the national accounts are like a credit card or a household budget. Those are stories too. And they're really bad stories. <laughs> um, and we tell a story in the public services. We've been telling the story that what matters is outcomes. We've been telling a story that what matters is value for money. And we've been leaving the human beings who deliver public services as well as the human beings who rely on them out of those stories. We've, we've told those stories in abstractions and I don't think it's been working. And so, uh, you know, I, one of the things that, that we've been doing and I'm, I, I know we'll, we'll get a chance to talk more, but um, we decided to get young people to redesign the welfare state and uh, one of the things we had to do was to construct the stories to introduce them all to, to the beginning of the work. And what we ended up doing was creating a tree and, uh, and, and describing the welfare state and the society in which it grows and that it serves as a tree with the economy and democracy in the roots, with love and belonging and health and purpose in the trunk. And the, and, and the public services that, that emerge from that performed by people, poor people, um, as being the architecture of the tree, the branches that grow and the leaves that, that spring from it. So um, one of the things that happened that we weren't expecting was that everyone just loves the tree. They don't yeah. actually, <laughs> lots of people don't really need to see more because it brings sense. It gives them a, a lesson from the story in just visual form. And so I think, you know, I'm in no doubt that the stories we tell are the most important thing. And I, I, I don't think it's just about telling the stories of the children that we serve. Um, sometimes we put too much emphasis on asking people to share their personal story, but we have to tell the, uh, the, the Aesop's fables of public service for the 21st century. Uh, and so we ought to think what's the moral of the story, not just the character and the plot. That's really interesting. So there's a sort of overarching storytelling that needs to happen as well as people's personal stories. And I was struck at the start when you said, almost you're saying stories are the great survivors from the past. And actually, if we want to communicate, that's the way we do it. Scott, 
the role of storytelling? Yeah, so so just building on a few things that Ben and Kathy have said, I think there's definitely something around storytelling has a role around co-producing uh, services. So building a narrative with others is a real uh, big part of developing really uh, good public services. So actually, you know, speaking to young people, if it's around kind of the, the welfare state, as Kathy was talking about, or if it's local people in communities around the things that matter to them, and actually resonating those stories back into, into the way that things are designed is really important. So I definitely think um, there's a role for storytelling around co-producing services and making sure that the voices of, of especially around, around marginalised groups in society are, are brought into the fore of that, that co-production. There's definitely something around the narrative that's out there at the moment. I think Kathy picked up on the the kind of the uh, challenges that we've got between you know uh, us standing out on a Thursday afternoon banging pans for the public sector and then us not being able to pay them uh, you know the the wages that they deserve. So I think there's something around the role of storytelling to to change narratives uh, and create movements uh, for people. So bringing people together around common themes is is a real important role that storytelling has. And the, and the final thing uh, that I've seen is around the role of storytelling in culture change. Um, we were part of the public sector um, for, for a long period of time, and we took a group of staff out of the public sector into, into the VCSC sector and, and, and had to change that culture. And there was a real role that storytelling kind of played around changing uh, the culture within the organisation. Um, there's a famous phrase, culture eat strategy for breakfast. So we spent a lot of time kind of creating a narrative that we shared together um, and, and created a story. And that journey that we've been on uh, is something that we've used when we brought new people into the organization to, to make sure that that culture stays the same and we and is around the values and the uh, and, and the ethos that we kind of set out to do in the first place. So I think those are the three kind of areas around co-production co of, of services, around changing the narrative and creating movements and around kind of making sure that we uh, we have a strong culture and 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 the ethos and the values of organisations are at the, the core of what people are trying to achieve. So that's really that there's there's that's really interesting as well, um, Scott. So I'm just thinking when one of the reasons I suppose the premise we set this up it, it was was a sort of assumption that actually perhaps there's not enough storytelling in public services, but I'm not sure you any of you have said that. And I think it might just be about how we tell the stories and what we use them for. So, I mean, Cathy, do you want to address that? Do you think there is enough storytelling in public services? I, I want to say yes and no at the same time. <laughs> um, I, I think we, I think I've been in this sector my entire career, adult career, you know, um, between working for council and working mainly for charities, but always for children. And, and we've been in an era where I think the reason that we've come to talk so much in metrics and statistics and insisted that um, impact must be measured and outcomes must be must have equivalent uh, savings and value, financial value, et cetera. Um, that is a story. So I, I want to, you know, so I am saying these are these are the stories that we've been constructing about what we do and why we do it. Um, but I think that underneath it, there's been a, a belief that tell it, telling human stories in human, with human emotion and, and, and compassion and feeling <laughs> um, isn't scientific enough. So we've, we've tried to then say, look, um, this is hard. This is hard end stuff. This is quantifiable, measurable. It's not about people feeling like they really love their social worker or, you know, uh, or, or proclamations of transformed life. We want hard numbers. And I think that that's been about um, placing higher value, like kind of a, a devaluing and a detrusting of the human, the human story <laughs> and, the, and the human benefit. Um, and uh, but it's still a story and at, at risk of going off on the abstract part of what blew my mind back at university was when I, I I've never been good with numbers but I was with a, I was in the maths college of Cambridge and surrounded by ridiculous sort of savant mathematicians and I had a conversation with one in his first year undergraduate and he said I'm going to have to write an essay uh, uh, about uh, to prove that one equals naught and I, so after my brain kind of got back into my head, I said, can you do that? 
And he said, yeah, yeah, it's easy. I said, but what, do you write it in words? He said, no, 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 mathematical formula. You use math, you use math to prove that one equals naught. And I, I said, I, firstly, I didn't know that was conceivable. But secondly, what, you know, like, are there many ways of doing it? And he said, yeah, the point is how you tell the story. So even in maths, which we consider to be completely abstracted from the sort of the subjectivity of mm. human life and, and, and story, there's storytelling. <laughs> so so I, I think we just need to comprehend that, that storytelling could be done well and storytelling can be done in ways that lead us astray. So, so I don't mind. Like, I think there are valuable no stories that we can tell with information, with numbers, with statistics. We can, we can create a picture of how big a problem is. But uh, sometimes if we think the numbers do the work, then we're missing out our job, which is to give it meaning, to, to show what you're meant to make of it. So yeah. I think plenty, there's plenty of storytelling that's going on in our sector within it and about it. And some of it is really badly inaccurate. Some of it is not owned as being a story that we can reconstruct. And too little of it is about human beings helping each other. Yeah, interesting. So, Ben, you, you raised that point earlier about sort of the statistics versus um, what we've called the stories. But I suppose one of the things Kat is saying is the statistics are a story. It's just another way of telling it. So tell us your, your experience about that sort of how those are used and sort of maybe build on what you said before? Um, I think that statistics, statistics are a blunt instrument for telling a story. It's the bit of the narrative that you, you wrap around them. So, you know, Newcastle now leads the way nationally on child poverty. Go us, 47% of kids in poverty in the city. You know, it's got considerably worse over the last, over the, the, the austerity period. And it was, it was challenging before. But uh, it, you know, it's the the story around the statistic becomes contested. So our experience in the city was doing, you know, what do we say about that externally as as the city council? What do we what when the newspaper approaches us? What do we write in the newspaper? Um, <laughs> what's our response to that? And how how do we how do we articulate that? And it becomes. Uh, a, a contested tool. I think the statistic that's that's what happens. And I think we, we, I completely agree uh, with what Kathy's just been saying. And, and, and well, all of us actually, because I think that the other parts of society are incredibly good at taking statistics and weaving a narrative that doesn't feel like they've added a value judgment to that statistic. What it feels like is they've just taken the statistic and told us, you know, it's like the, the old adage in football, the results never lie, except when they want to tell us that actually that team that did terribly badly was a very noble team and the manager was excellent and they should probably get the England job next. You know, the narrative is always whatever is always value driven. So um, to an extent, I think what, what, what I've tried to do is redress the balance by going, well, who's, who's value, who's value judgment on that, on that statistic should we really care about? And ultimately should be the subject of the statistic, shouldn't we? So if the subject of the, the child poverty statistic is children living in poverty, well, let's find out what children actually think. What is the story they tell about their own experience of poverty? And the interesting thing in Newcastle is in the mass consultation we did last year, 1900 babies, children, young people, we consulted about the state of the city in their life in the as we were really getting into the depths of the early, early stages of the real depths of the cost of living crisis. Very few of them used the word poverty. Very few of them talked about bills. Very few of them talked about not turning the gas on. They talked about places to play. They talked about not feeling safe in the park. They talked about the school down the road that had a dog that they could stroke in a separate room when they felt a bit wobbly and that they'd really like a dog they could stroke in a separate room in their school a bit wobbly. Their their day to day stories were about a different type of lived experience, all connected <laughs> to poverty and austerity and resource. And, you know, that 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 wider world. But they were very individual and very personal. And it's until you dig into that. What does it mean to you? What does this statistic mean to you? Until you dig into that, you can't possibly, I think, understand what the solutions might be. Otherwise, the solution is always save money or spend money on the last thing that evidentially was proven to be successful. And it might be different in different, the, the intervention might be different in different circumstances. So I think, but my mission has always been, certainly in this job, let's put the stories of children and young people to, to front and center that they tell about themselves but then you have to support and enable them to do that really effectively in, in we're using the the tools that are appropriate for them to do that and also how can we aggregate those stories so we put a mass number of them together so it becomes impossible to look away 
from their perspective on their own their own circumstance. And when you do that enough, you start to get you start to get the possibility of a different kind of collective narrative and change. And actually, this is not just us. This is the Harvard Business School teaching business leaders, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, that telling the story of their employees and their end users of their products is much more effective than the number crunching on how their sales went in the Far East. Find out what people in the Far East are saying when they buy their products and then use that to drive the direction of the business. Um, and some of the most successful businesses in the last 15, 20 years have taken that story-based approach. And I'm not saying I want to borrow a relief from business book, but actually, <laughs> what I do yeah. is let me know the people who are the subject of those statistics. What do they really think and feel? What really matters to them? Yeah, well, so we'll 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 talk about some of these things in a minute on co-production, on the use of um, children's stories, other people's stories in shaping services and in creating the whole narrative around children's services. I just want to stand up for statistics for a moment <laughs> because I know that they all feature in all our jobs and they do tell us important things. I think what Cathy said and Ben you've agreed is that they have a narrative or they need to have a narrative ab ab above them and I think what we are appreciating here first you've got to recognize there is one and secondly it's got to be the right one. So I went to a conference last week um, of social workers and it was all full of statistics and all this sort of stuff that we were, we were talking about, you know, what, what happened to children in care and what have you. But the only thing that I, the main thing I remember from the conference is a story that I heard. And that's, and the, the question, the question was, what is social work? And the story I heard was from, and I credit colleagues from Leeds for this, was, was, a, um, was a social worker who went to see a mum who was, who was, off, who, whose child they were worried about and was worried that they were endangered. They knocked on the door, the mum wouldn't answer, wouldn't let her in. So instead of calling the police, which is what some social workers might have done and who battered down the door, they went and picked up a coffee and stood at the door again and the mum let her in. And they developed a relationship over the, over the weeks following that and the child was safe. And then in six weeks, time, in six weeks later, six, eight weeks later, the, the, the lady who let her in, the mum, asked the social worker to be the birthing partner for her second child. And that's, that's what stuck in my head from the conference. You know, if you want to know what social work is, that's what social work is for. Um, I'm sure we've all got stories, something that, that, that sort of resonate like that. Scott, can we pick up one of the points you made earlier about um, the use of storytelling in co-production? Yeah. So how? So I, I think what you mean by that is how stories can help you shape services, um, or help users shape their own services. Yeah. So so we've we've done some really interesting work in in Greater Manchester around residential care. So obviously there's lots of stats around. You know everyone knows how uh, residential children's services are under a lot of pressure at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of extractive organisations taking money out of the system. And, and the outcomes for children are, are not great sometimes. You know, sometimes they, they, they're good, but sometimes they're not. Um, so we've just done a whole piece of work in GM, working with young people, where we've got the voices of those young, young people kind of into how to redesign some of those residential children's services. Um, and, and the main way we've done that is through engaging people to kind of document their stories, their, their experience of being in the care system, um, telling us what things have gone well, what things have not gone so well. And, and then using that to, to shape the way that we, um, you know, we've, we've, we've developed the plan for, for, for changing things in the future. So I think there's a great opportunity to use storytelling to kind of get the voice of people that, that you would not, not normally hear in, in, in those discussions um, and, and are often missed in, 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 in those discussion, discussions because, you know, as Ben said, they, they, they don't really care about the stats. They, they want to share their experience um and, and a really good way to do that is through through the power of storytelling and kathy when it comes to so one of the things i've sort of so my background too is in the voluntary sector and i've wondered whether that particularly on maybe on this co-production point that the voluntary sector is better at telling stories than the public sector um what do you think uh, sounds like it's calling for an objective judgment that I'm not up for giving. <laughs> I certainly, um, one of the things that I 
I mean, I always do if I get the chance is to tell the story of my organization and it helps it really, you know, it just how did it start? What was happening when it started? It, 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 it's far better than saying these are our strategic goals and this is our objective for this year or, you know, here's how many people we help. Uh, and, and I think that most many charities understand the power of those stories you know, uh, whatever it is, whatever their origin story, but because they were they were created with a mission and, and, and a mission is a story. So so um, I don't you know, I've I've come across charity. I've worked in charities that didn't have much of a mission story and I've worked in public services where the stories were were what drove it. Um, so I, I don't think we can be too oversimplistic about it, but I think. So, so I think one of the things uh, I saw that there was a, a, a question about f further about metaphor, and I think you know that's certainly what we found with our tree, um, and some of these things, you know, the things that I'm criticising as well, the the credit card household budget metaphor for our national economics, it is a metaphor and it's a bad one, um, but uh, one of the most powerful things I think is to be able to tell stories that resonate with childhood about childhood <laughs> without you know so not only you know what does life feel like for a child in, in in particular circumstances today but the fact that every single human being to whom we're communicating was once a child so so if we can if we can it, it is a you know it's no coincidence that so many of the most beloved story tell you know fairy fairy stories and 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 kind of you know traditions our traditional storytelling often center on childhood some some drama in childhood some trauma in childhood or you know children being on an adventure in some kind of way um because because uh, not just as you said in the opening children love uh, and, and grow in story <laughs> Um, but because society does but uh, but but our love of storytelling and our ability to interpret story is rooted in childhood but we may have all had very different childhoods but we all know how it feels to be small and new in the world <laughs> and for, the, for to, to be having those journeys of discovery or or fear or you know so so um so i i i think all of us could be better at storytelling but when i say that i don't just mean about children i think we need to be better at constructing a story that engages people takes them on a journey has a beginning, a middle, an end, and a point. Um, and, and we can use statistics in those stories too. I completely agree with you about that, but they won't tell a story on their own. That's interesting. And so I, I wonder, Ben, if you've got any reflections on, on, on that as a sort of the narrative power of storytelling, not, not just for individual stories, but for organisations. And I guess you're gonna have to be thinking about that, aren't you, in your new role? Yeah, well, for organisations and places, I mean, organisations are collections of people, places are collections of people, you know, it's it, it's how it works. It's one of the, I mean, it, it, you go right the way back to the history and that's the benefit of a drama school and postgraduate film education, I suppose. But, you know, you go back to the history and origins of storytelling as far as we know it in, in human society. It's often about uh, this is who we are and where we are together and this is who we might be or where we might be in the future if we're together in greater ways or move around or share or actually you've got all the crops and we've got all the cattle <laughs> let me tell you how we made our cattle strong let me tell us about your crops let's see if we can do something together so I think there's as a kind of almost human imperative to tell those stories in those ways I think that we I think Kathy's right I think we forget that organizations become bureaucracies quite quickly um, even when they don't intend to, and there's good bureaucracy and not so good bureaucracy, and the not so good bureaucracy tends to struggle to own its own story, I think, and tell its own story. And, and I think the same thing can happen with places. We talk about placemaking on a city level very often, don't we? But there's placemaking on a very, very local level, the street level, the hyperlocal level around a school or around a children's centre, wherever it may be. Um, and again, when things aren't quite right, we tend to lose the place. And then we're always searching for that question of what is our identity? What's our story? What's our narrative? What's our one catch line? And um, I suppose my main reflection is it's always in it's always in the people. It's always in the interaction between the people. If you take that very basic anthropological definition of culture, I think that culture each is policy for breakfast phrase is always a really useful one to start with. But the basic anthropological definition is culture is the way we do things around here. Well, the way we do things around here is a constantly evolving thing. 
it's a story <laughs> in in its own right. So I think the one thing we can all do better um, in all the different sectors is recognize the collective nature of our story and that we're constantly cohering and recohering it. And it, it's always in debate, which then for me also takes you then back to the very in, individual level. Um, and there is lots of study around the psychological effect of storytelling on you as a person, and even people who tell completely fictional, fantastical stories about themselves sometimes are incredibly happy <laughs> and well-adjusted people because they're owning their own story, even if it's not entirely based in fact. And I think that the 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 I it, it's a, funnily enough have a team away day with the Voice and Influence team in Newcastle uh, tomorrow, partly to pay, prepare for my departure, and we're starting the day by doing life maps and stories of the team including some young trainees in the team, so we can see where we're all coming from with a little bit on the end of the, the road at the map for what the next year might be and what we might like the new story to be. And the hope is that that magically connects in a constructed story that's collected between us because we find the points that join and, and, and connect. Um, and every time I've ever done that in the past, it has worked. The same sort of approach works with organisations, I think, and places, but it, it has to be invested in in time and I think the wheels of decision making often don't give us the time to cohere that story collectively. We've got to make a budget decision by Friday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got to write the policy document by Monday. Oh, leveling up has not quite worked for our city. What the hell are we going to do? We've got to make a protest. Can we all respond to the manifesto commitments by Tuesday? So, you know, it's all that sort of stuff. And what you really need is the time to talk and explore and unpick and share the stories using whatever tools are appropriate. So metaphor mentioned before, but Metaphor for me is, is is partly a tool for understanding the story and making more sense of the meaning the story gives you. So you can do stuff visually and you can do all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, I think we can be better at the collective story, but we have to give that time and take, I guess, there's also a sense of personal and organizational responsibility for that story and know that it's constantly changing and we we own it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Scott, I think it would be worth picking up some of those threads that from because I know you 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 talked already about how important the story is to an individual to an organization, mm. sort of for getting colleagues to work together, for getting people to understand what the organization is for. So perhaps you could say a bit about that and how storytelling has been part of your journey in social adventures. Yeah, definitely. So so there's definitely something around weaponizing your story. So how do you create a weapons grade story? Um, because that that if, if you're in the kind of, I mean, I think we're all on this call in the in the kind of uh kind of sphere of wanting to make changes, you know, in the communities that we work in, in the places that we we work with, the people that we work with, and 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 creating a weapons grade story really kind of drives that. Um and, and it kind of does a few different things. I think it creates innovation. I think often. You know, although I think stories always should be backed up by evidence, I think often that can be that can stifle innovation. So creating stories kind of give people the autonomy and the power to do things differently. Um, and that's something that we've we've kind of worked on quite a lot. Um, I think there's definitely something around its role in culture change and culture shift and 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 how you kind of revisit that culture. Uh, sorry, revisit that story and how that then influences the culture is really important. So Scott, so, what do you mean by that? Do you mean, are there sort of little stories that reinforce the wider messages you're trying to tell? Is there what? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a famous quote, sailors tell tales, pirates make legends. So, you know, there's something around kind of, how do you make a legend within your organization? How do you, how do you create a story that, that inspires people to do other things? And what we did when we, when we came out of the NHS, we we created a, a kind of a set of narratives that we shared with people uh, that gave them the autonomy to do things differently. Um, so, you know, there's a famous story about um, myself and a colleague uh, buying someone who was suicidal, uh, who living in a, a local uh, on a, in a local tower block near to, to where we worked when we were part of the NHS. We went out and bought them a dog, which was pretty much in breach of every rule that you could have. Uh, so we got dragged in front of the finance director and the chief exec to explain why we bought this this guy a dog and what we the dog cost about four hundred quid I think if I remember rightly um, and we hadn't done a risk assessment on it and we hadn't gone through the the, the process to to do that um, and we thought we were going to get sacked at the time we thought the next thing would be P forty fives all round 
Um, but what we said to them is, give us give us two months. And this guy was constantly coming into the GP practices locally, constantly accessing services. And we actually we actually managed to quantify that it would save about four and a half grand over a two month period. And the four hundred quid investment was actually quite a small thing. Um, and we told that we told that 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 story to staff when we spun out of the NHS. And what we found is that it inspired them to start doing things in a different way. So I think there's a real important role. Um, and, and part of it is legend. You know, we, did, well, we didn't really think we'd get sacked and we kind of embellished yeah. some of the some of the yeah, tale yeah. a little bit. Um, but but it, it was around creating a narrative that would would inspire people to do things diff- in a different way. So I think there's, there's a role for storytelling around around culture. I think there's a role around inspiring people to do things differently. Um, and I think there's a role around kind of it, its role around kind of creating innovation in organisations. I mean, you must be. I mean, that sounds. I can imagine that story. You know, if your staff know that story, that almost gives them permission to to do things a bit differently, don't they? I mean, if that and I'm sure there's more stories like that. And that is that is what it. You know, I guess that's one of the powers of storytelling. To to and. And don't take this the wrong way, Scott, but I've heard you tell the same stories over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. and I'm sure that's deliberate, you know, that that that's what the um that's sometimes what's called for. There is something about retelling and retelling and retelling the tale. Um and the tale becomes less of a tale and more of a legend over time. Um and, and the story gets changed slightly. And you know, I, I remember coming off stage once uh, when I'd done a presentation and one of my colleagues said, do we actually do all, all of those things? And I said, oh, no, no, we don't do them all, but we do most of them. And the ones that, that we've said that we don't do, we'll be doing next week or the month after. So you kind of, it, I think there's also something around projecting, using story as a way of projecting things out there to, to your staff team to make things happen, to create change, as yeah. well as just using yeah. it around documenting what's, happen, what's already happened as well. No, I think that's right. And Ben and Kathy both touched on this, the fact that the stories don't have to be true. Um, you know, Kathy referenced Aesop's fables, which aren't literally true, are they? I mean, it, it, it's a story that makes a point. Um, so, uh, Kathy, maybe you've got thoughts on that in terms of how true do they have to be? I think so. Um, I, I mean, it, it depends what kind of story you're telling. I, I mean, I would argue that that you need to be illuminating something that is a truth for the purpose that you that you're trying to communicate about and 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 just embrace the subjectivity of that <laughs> this is you know this is not an empirical truth <laughs> like you know water water boils at 100 degrees c it, it's about uh grasp what is it that you really want to it to get common understanding of because that's that's the power of story is to tell a story uh, that people will react to even if they you know it might be very close to their experience or it might be something they've never experienced before but if a a story is well told they will hear what it's meant to convey I think I think some of the and that's why I think as I said before I think connecting it to the experience of childhood the the human experience of being a child um, whether it's that you want to convey how bad something is for a child that is happening to another child, even if it didn't happen to you. That's why you should root it in what it feels like to be that child is because we've all been a child. Mm-hmm. So, so that can create the connection to an experience that you might not have had, but could comprehend. But, um, but I think in, our, in particular in our sector and our stories, and you know, we've got some really, really important retelling of our stories to do in public services right now. You know, this is the biggest strike day in British public service history. <laughs> and I think part of the issue has been but 10 years of, of, of underpay, longer than that, really, if all truth be told. Um, that's because we forgot that public services are made up of people, not mm. people work for it. <laughs> mm. There's, there is no public service without people. So we, we stop talking about it as the people who do it predominantly, particularly in public service management. <laughs> and then suddenly we can't afford the people who we need, you know, like we can't afford not to, but we've, we've gone down a story that says cost is to be controlled. That's, that's the mark of good management. So, so we, we've got some real reframing to do about public services, nothing without people. <laughs> um, 
but but I also think uh, I think we have some. It, it's worth taking the time in terms of how you construct the story. I saw there was a question about the elements of a good story. Have a think about time frame. Why why does the story that you want to tell start where it starts? <laughs> So, you know, uh, uh, as I was saying, our char my charity story starts in 1942. I can date it, but it has good reason. That that's when Beveridge came out. We were preparing for the peace. We were at war. Children were being evacuated. And so, and so it, it, the, the story starting there gets to today um, with resonance to, to that journey since then and all that's happened since then. And sometimes I think we tell a story, in, in particularly in public sector, in public policy, and by, by reference to electoral cycles. So we're currently caught in a system where we tend to be telling a story of either the last seven years or the last two yeah. years or the last 13 years. Well, why aren't we telling a story of the last 35 years? in public service? Because that's really kind of, the, the, there's a datable consistency Mm. about how we've been approaching public services, about how we've been selling selling public service contracts off to private sector organisations, and now it's come. Now it's come to tipping points. But but that story isn't properly told unless you take it back to where it began. Yeah. And we, we need to kind of, uh, you know, we need to spend a bit of time on the right arc of the story, whatever it is, whether it's... I, I really like Ben's point about saying we can be telling better stories about places... Mm. that bring that bring people together and create that sense of belonging but so similarly where does this story really need to start to 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 convey what we want to convey is so is so important or special so you kind of we, you know need to go full pelt if we're going to be good storytellers be willing to kind of embellish bits of it whiz past other bits but bits of it <laughs> pick you know i wouldn't i wouldn't say be completely fictitious but the story is more important than the accuracy, I would say. Yeah, okay, interesting. And so that question you, so we've, we've had some questions in and that question Cathy just referred to from Louise, what, I'll ask the others to um, reflect on as well. What makes a good story? Um, and are there building blocks that would help to make the story more powerful and persuasive? Um, and then there was a point earlier about the role of metaphor and maybe that's one of those points. But Ben, perhaps you want to address that question. Are there building blocks that could help make the story more powerful and persuasive? Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at kind of story theory from the analysis of, of our myths and legends, the kind of Vladimir prop analysis, if anybody would want to go look at that stuff way back. But, you know, they're, they're, they're nearly always about uh, something that has to be overcome or a challenge uh, and, a, per, and, a, and a, a person or a set of people we can identify with attempting to wrestle with that challenge and a, re a result that they get to most most human stories the ones that really catch have that that bit in but you, you know that doesn't have to be uh go what's the best popular culture reference this is pre-covid now isn't it it doesn't have to be thanos arriving to destroy the the, the universe with the click of his fingers you know the, the 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 challenge can be um how you walk down the street i just reminded story I, I told a particularly good story in the, in the course of walking from the high street, Chillingham Road, my high street here in Heaton in Newcastle, from one end to the other whilst walking my my son down the street the other day, because it's the street I used to walk down as a, at his age, he's 14, all the time. And it's completely different, but also very much the same. <laughs> it now has shops selling food from all around the world and a whole different demographic of people living there. It's kind of slightly vibrant, a little bit hipster. You know, it's got all that sort of stuff to it. Whereas when I was his age, it was kind of desolate and it had one spa. And I told the story of the change in each of the shops as we kind of went past to the different communities that had come in. Um, and at the end, I went, are you a bit bored? And he went, no, it's amazing. It's like this place was shit and now it's really good. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess that is the story. I, in, I, I constructed that this was basically quite rough and I used to feel quite scared as well as it was my home. You don't feel that, do you? What's changed? And all these people and the guy whose name you know, who's who's from Iran, who works in the shop that sells the veg and the person you know is up there who's got the coffee shop and moved in as a student from from uh, Bradford and has stayed here for 25 years. And so, you know, that it felt like uh, that moment where you kind of intuitively say there was something to overcome and to transform. 
and these are the people that did it and you can identify with them all and that connection is is built in that way so i suppose to me the core building blocks are what's the what's the issue what's the thing mm -hmm. that is is the challenge is that is thing and so i suppose when you're telling the story of a charity or a council or a place partly it's what is this place what is this organization about what's it for and who are the people, the bits, the things that put together, and then you can build that up as you go over time. I do think the other part of it is that stories, we have to be careful, I suppose, particularly think about this with my new job, stories can outstay their welcome <laughs> sometimes um, if we're not careful and they can become too long and you can be telling too much of, of the story. But equally, I think we are, including children, very fascinated with the past and how we got here. And there is a tendency at the moment to think of things in Instagram stories in the very now, the very moment, the very two minute TikTok video of what this person is doing that must be new. Yeah, I think you can liberate yourself to say, well, what do we learn and where do we get it from? As long as you go to the heart of the thing that people are trying to overcome, remember who those who those 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 people are. We love stories that end with a positive ending. Mm -hmm. But I think when we're trying to make change, it's often very useful to have a story that ends with a, a difficult outcome that could have been different. <laughs> and so again, I go back to a point I kind of made earlier. Don't shake off your own value judgments and your own politics and your own principles. Nobody else is. <laughs> Be quite blatant about the fact that I'm telling you this story because if we paid nurses more, <laughs> we'd have a better NHS. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you this story to, to illustrate that point. Let me qualify that for you with the, the illustration and the illumination that, that I bring. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's interesting. Interesting about stories. Um outstaying their welcome i bet there's loads of organizations where there's this i mean it's that thing you do why are you doing this well i'm doing it because i've always done it and why are you doing that well there's this story sort of in my head where it, this is how it works and actually that was three decades ago and it doesn't work anymore um scott what about you in terms of what makes a good story in the building blocks so i think this, I've, I've kind of been thinking as uh, ben and kathy have been talking so they give me a bit of time to kind of reflect but i think there's some ingredients i think there's some building blocks that ben and kathy have picked up on but i think there's three ingredients that i'll throw into the mix as well i think one of the things around what makes good stories is being frank with people so making sure that you're you're really clear about what the challenge is um and 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 being being honest being real with people about what that that challenge is i think is really important I think it's something around being fearless. I think we've become we've become um, quite scared, really, of saying stuff and being outspoken these days. I think you know there there are so many different uh, channels now of communication, like TikTok and Instagram and social media and the the wider media in general. I think that that has made us much much more um, much scared more scared as pu public sector leaders. Um, both in the public sector and in the in the social sector, to actually be fearless about what we're saying um, and ask for forgiveness rather than permission to say things. Um, you know, um, I think we've you know in my organisation we've, we've we've put ourselves and 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 our colleagues on media training. You know, to try and you know, and it's been it's come out recently, hasn't it? And I think it was on GMTV with Matt Hancock about how he pivoted from questions and answering questions. So I think there is something about us being fearless around, around, uh, around telling stories. And I think the final thing is about being fair, fair with each other and uh, fair with what we're trying to get across. Because I think, as Cathy said, sometimes it's not necessarily around, uh, it, it's around the, the essence of the narrative rather than the narrative itself. So I think you've got to be, you've got to have that sense of, 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 of balance in what you're trying to say, uh, because I think that makes it the gen the more genuine the tale you're telling, the more honest you are with what you're saying, uh, the more it'll land with people that are around you and, and and the easier it will be to convey the message. So I think we're all a bit fed up and a bit jaded around being uh, kind of fed certain narratives from people uh, that we don't necessarily believe or, or think that they're being genuine with. Right. So I so think was, yeah, sorry, go on, John. Go on, sorry. I was just going to pick out sort of almost the word authentic describes some of that. And so, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, yeah, being being real. And when so when it comes to being authentic, does then does it matter who tells the story then, or whose voice is in the story? For me, for me, John, on that one, I think, um, and particularly speaking from a work in the cultural sector, and I guess the job I'm, I'm going to be doing, I think sometimes it does. It, it it's it's contextual, but I think there's been some really progressive 
movements, particularly in the culture sector, to 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 move away from what some people call cultural imperialism. So you know, the kind of ownership of stories that are clearly about and belong to people with a particular set of shared cultural cultural and and, and personal and political social experiences, and uh, uh, giving people the room to tell those stories and the support to tell those stories them, themselves. That doesn't mean though that the story shouldn't be told elsewhere and seen by other people. So I suppose I kind of turn that question around a bit and go, well, who's the audience? Because sometimes who tells the story partly depends on the audience. We've been doing a lot of work in Newcastle with transport providers around costs of transport because it's, mm -hmm. it's really challenging. And actually some of those chief executives and managing directors of the transport providers in a deregulated, confusing system what will only listen to certain people. Taking them the impoverished bus traveler who can't afford to get on the bus kind of doesn't work <laughs> you have to go through with the chief exec of another organization who goes to them and say and then pulls the other stories into the room to create to create the platform so i do i do think authenticity which is different to truth matters first and foremost i do think we need to strive to give people the platform to tell their own stories and 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 fight against the ownership of people's stories by people who are clearly very different from them but sometimes you have to think about who is best to open the doorway to, to tell the story to the audience you want to impact the most. Interesting. So Kathy's nodding her head there. there. So stories need a platform. Well, stories definitely need, but there is no story unless you, you're telling it to some people. So, um, in, uh, you know, uh, but it might be how you tell the story of what you do at a, at a party. <laughs> it might be well, what you do and why you do it. You know, it, it, the, we've we've had this awful phrase of an elevator pitch, you know, that you should have ready for a, for possibly meeting Bill Gates in a lift, and uh, you know, th these are all forms of storytelling, but they rely on on um, thinking on your feet about what this person might be interested in or these people. So just to give you, I mean, I won't I won't retell the story, but if they, if, if anyone has listened to the podcast I did with Andrew Laird. Um, which I think is probably how I ended up here and my, our story about having a very unexpected campaign win, wholesale campaign win in three weeks uh, from beginning to end against Michael Gove um, as a tiny charity. Now, the, uh, that is an authentic story. It def we definitely did it and it definitely happened. Um, but uh, there, there, are, there are ways that I've told that story to fellow chief execs that focus on the kind of the dilemma and the and the and the um, decision making that we that I took and that as a person, but uh, that we took as an organisation um, about deciding to fail. Um, there, there is a there is a version, an authentic version of that story that anyone who works for my charity can can authentically tell about how significant that was for children for for the sector. Um, as a piece of work that we did and shaping the future shape of the organization. Uh, there's, there's a version of that story that I can tell to campaign colleagues uh, of all kinds about how we framed that campaign and, and why that was significant. You know, so, so um, one story, if it contains multiple aspects of what you, what you want to convey. So in every version of that, uh, you would be hearing what our values are and what we stand for. No, that's, 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 oh, sorry, Cathy, go on. No, no, I'm just saying that, that in some versions of that, it does need to be me who tells the story, but only the ones that are about me and how I felt. But there are versions of that story that can authentically be told by anyone who saw it or took part in it. Yeah, well, so that that's a really good example. And when we when I send around the 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 um, recording after this I'll send a link to that as well if people are interested but it it shows how storytelling can change lives which I suppose is what we're talking about here really and um, we're sort of approaching the end of this now so I just want to ask you all just for your one reflection we've covered a lot of ground here so what's your one reflection on storytelling that you might take back to your organization from this discussion maybe Ben first Tell more, but um, I'm, I'm particularly the organisational story. Uh, uh, local authorities are difficult for organisational stories because they're they're almost not one organisation really, and also they have political leadership who have a particular story they want to tell, 
But um, Kathy's point about you know stories to, from, with, by children, putting yourself in the place of the uh, the child. Um, I think we, I think councils are particularly bad at that. <laughs> Our staff might be quite good at it, but I think as organisations are particularly bad at it. So I think reflection for me is how do we translate some of the stories we've made and written and prepared for decision makers into stories that really work for children in yeah. in the city. Scott. I think there's definitely something around kind of making sure that you uh the fact that you said that you'd heard some of my stories already John I was a bit kind of taken aback by that because uh you know <laughs> uh, but I think is it uh, I think I think uh, Ben mentioned this sometimes stories can become stale so I think there's a need to continually generate new stories and make sure that the narrative can continues to evolve um and and sometimes even though you should have a, a good beginning middle and end sometimes the end is not the end it's just the, the end of the chapter and and there's something around kind of opening a new chapter of a story and and kind of starting that that next chapter as well. Uh, and if I was in a, 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 an elevator with Bill Gates, I'd ask him how to fix Microsoft Teams, not not give him an ele elevator pitch. So that would be my uh, my thing to take away from today. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, I'm going. Well, I'm going to pick up seamlessly from Scott. I mean, I think all of the stories that we've learned to tell. Through, through my work through, in my career but through Children England have been to, for the point of getting people to believe that we can do things differently you know it's in it, it, essentially it's been to tell enough of a story uh to enable people who think that what we're trapped in today uh this economy this this way of thinking this unaffordability this accepting you know uh like JD sports hierarchies of management um you know that th there was a time when that wasn't the case that makes the fact that we're in it changeable and that there are ways that we could change it and and all of the stories that we we try and deploy in one way shape or form all the metaphors are about empowering people to understand we made all of this as human beings including the stories that we tell so if we made it all we can make something else happen just as easily so That's I think I, I, I think story has to be empowering and I'd, I'd really like if anyone is interested do get in touch I'd really like to write a new ESOP's fables about public service well that's a I mean that is a great idea I think um, mm -hmm. and a good a good note to end on that, that stories can change change minds and change lives so hopefully everybody who's attended today has sort of got the sense of the powerful role of storytelling to motivate and change minds and when someone tells us a story, I think we catch a glimpse of a new way of looking at the world that's, that could be different to what we're doing now. And so some of what we've heard today, just to stories to illustrate, illuminate and persuade, they need to be authentic, frank, fearless and fair. And we, there needs to be a storyteller, there needs to be a platform and we can use them to make real change. So I know it's a difficult time to be in public services in many ways, and I hope this discussion has given everybody attending some food for thought and some inspiration. Um, please get in touch if you would like to talk to us or any advice, and we'd, we're delighted to talk to you a bit more. I'll circulate a copy of the talk for you to share with colleagues after the, the panel, on, and please do drop me a line if you want to. So finally, just to say thank you to all our speakers for their time. Thank you for you for joining us and we'll see you again soon.